So, uh, for those of you that don't know, this is my second horror novel, Rhea Poke. And actually, second is kind of a misnomer because it came out about the same time as Crimson Tassels due to some scheduling conflicts and getting editors and whatnot. So, um, I am going to uh, be reading out of this one, and I've been practicing all the morning just to get my timing right. I think I can make it through about three chapters without too much of a problem. So, uh, this is Rhea Poke by me. Chapter 1. The Dangers of Camping The morning shone through the canopy of trees like beautiful cascading mini waterfalls of light. Had they not been so low on provisions, Carl Jensen might have allowed a lengthier stay in the warmth of the sleeping bag. Next to him, the sleeping mat belonging to Mary Conway, a stunning brunette he had befriended on the trail, lay unrolled. He wasn't into one-night stands, however, this relationship stretched out the better part of a week. Mary grew on him. She must have gotten up to ten camp. Carl pushed the tent flap aside, revealing the beautiful mountain vista. The spot was Mary's idea. Consulting the map in their cross-country hike, the trail curved slightly inward, deep into the Virginian forest. Their campsite was strategically located near a lake and a small town. The lake promised a place to run water through a filter, and the town, although small, provided a place for additional provisions and a hot meal for a change. Reconstituted trail food ensured nutritional needs were met, but a burger and fries helped them push farther toward their destination. The campsite stood 75 feet off the trail in a little stand of pines. Trees provided a windbreak from the breeze blowing off the mountain. From a small break in the foliage, Carl focused a pair of binoculars on the tops of houses and buildings in the distance, as well as a taller structure featuring a large neon coffee cup, suggesting a cafe or a restaurant. Pulling the laces of his boots tight, Carl stood and stretched, enjoying the serene picture the rural townscape painted. <clears throat> Mary didn't appear to be in camp. While nothing more than a summer fling, a little notice before she left for town ahead of him was the polite thing to do. Carl was just about to walk off into the underbrush with a roll of toilet paper and a metal trowel when something stopped him. Mary's pack boots and hiking stick leaned against a fallen log while he knew mary while he knew little about mary no good hiker ever went anywhere without a pair of trusty boots and a hiking stick it didn't make sense wondering if mary took off running naked through the woods made carl smile mary proved on more than one occasion to be wildness incarnate the summer stood out as one of the more memorable adventures he'd had Walking toward the dark woods of a, for a morning constitutional, the rubber sole of his boot stepped in something wet and squishy. He had more than once stepped into bear or fox poop and desperately hoped this was not the case now. He stood and examined the dark, slick liquid. It looked like reddish oil. Likely a logger's vehicle probably broke down here, and the careless asshole just let it leak fluid from a broken line or something. Some people are so inconsiderate. Something else caught his attention a few feet ahead of him, in the shade of a tree. A clump of fur lay balled up in the dark. Fairly long for an animal, its brunette color marred only by streaks of blood and dirt that matted the fur. The metallic smell of blood stung his Carl's nostrils. What the frig? he murmured, to no one in particular. Whatever took the unfortunate creature was less than kind. Turning the fur over with a stick that lay, that lay nearby, he noticed hair and still had... He noticed the hair still had skin attached to it, ripped out or cut off in a hunter in a haste to harvest the animal. Carl decided to search for another spot to relieve himself when the sunlight caught the mass of hair, blood, and dirt just right in the sunlight. <clears throat> in the ball, something metallic glinted back at him. Jabbing at the mass with a stick, a small piece of metal fell out. Carl recoiled in horror at, rec at recognition of the piece of jewelry, a cross. More precisely, Mary's cross. Backing away from the horrifying sight, he tripped over the moist patch on the ground. The liquid gave up its true identity. Blood. Hold it right there, a voice yelled at Carl, breaking the silence of the woods. Carl turned around and he couldn't believe his eyes. A police officer happened to come walking up the trail. At this exact moment, he discovered this horrifying mess. Officer, I need help. The police officer drew his pistol. Hold it right there. Don't move a muscle. Officer, I can explain. Something awful has happened to my friend. I need help. Aware someone else was standing behind him, opposite the officer, Carl turned to see who it was. 
His gaze swept over the landscape, just in time to catch the swing of something black towards his head. Carl Jensen clung to a remaining question as the woods, tent, and little town faded. Why isn't this officer helping me? Unfamiliar smells woke him. All around the walls danced like caricatures of themselves, as if an artist painted on a disproportionate on the disproportionate shadows being cast in an infinite number of directions. Carl wondered if he was dreaming for realizing this was the inside of a dark cave lit with flickering torches. Trying to lift his head and neck, the pain seared through him like a sword thrust through an eye socket and down into his neck, only one eye opened in response to his desire to see. To the left, chained to a wall, a woman hung lifeless. It took a moment or two to recognize the broken body of Mary. Half of her beautiful hair had been ripped out, and a laceration above the right eye, above her right eye, bled all over the woman's face. Carl's hands and arms screamed out in pain, confirming he was also bound to the wall. The rope seared his hands and arms as the weight of his body pulled down on them. He attempted to stand, but his legs refused to cooperate. <clears throat> I see our friend Carl is awake now, Master, a voice called out in front of him. Shall I knock him out again? It is not my will, High Priest. Let the tribute witness the ceremony. The fear will make his heart all the tastier. Tasty? What the hell is this guy talking about? Carl tried to say something, however his lips and tongue refused to work in unison. Proceed, High Priest, the deep voice bellowed through the cavern. Yes, Master. A black-robed figure responded. Two other figures emerged from the side of the cave. Their robes were white, in contrast to the other man, and looked like monk's robes with Native American ornamentation. Carl couldn't recall ever seeing anything like it. The figure in black approached Mary, saying something unintelligible. He reached up and grabbed her collar. Pulling it away, the man's other arm came up with a small blade and plunged down in an arc, cutting the shirt off. With Mary's breasts exposed, the man stepped back as if to admire them. The one identified as the master spoke up in a language which sounded to Carl like the language the priest had spoken. Two figures, clad in white, approached the man in black and handed him two daggers in exchange for the short-bladed knife. Carl spied the opulently bejeweled handles of the blades glinting in the firelight. The black-robed figure slid one of those daggers into a sh in a sheath in his belt while keeping the other in his right hand. The master stopped speaking and the man in black plunged the dagger deep into Mary's stomach. A harsh scream escaped Mary's lips the moment before death or pain rendered her mute. Carl wanted to avert his eyes or even register some sort of protest. Any attempt to move his neck or even speak was met with excruciating pain. The man in black rolled up a sleeve and plunged his arm deep into the wound he'd inflicted. Working the blade upwards in a sawing motion, he cut and plied away portions of her chest cavity with disturbing imprecision. Mary's innards spilled out onto the floor in a sickening pile of human tissue. The leaves of the sleeves of the black robe became slick as they sopped up more and more blood from the gruesome display. The robed figure held up Mary's excavated heart. With this heart, I thank thee for the most holy of sacrifices. I declare this heart holy and this sacrifice worthy of the master. Turning from the now still body, the man in black brought the heart to the altar at the front of the cave. Carl tried to follow the ghastly proceedings. The injuries from the beating he'd received proved so severe that even the simple act of lifting his head hurt too much. The master let out a sigh, clearly satisfied with whatever he had done with the heart. In the briefest of moments, the man in black stood before Carl. You are selected to make the ultimate tribute, the ultimate tribute to our master. You shall become one with him, and the name Carl Jensen will be written among the stars for all eternity. This is indeed a great day. A sharp pain struck Carl as the flash of the steel blade disappeared into his abdomen. That's chapter one. <clears throat> I have to take a little bit of tea at least. This I promise this is actually tea. I'm not drinking heavily yet. <clears throat> Chapter 2. A Quiet Morning on Lake Oleander Waylon Anderson cast a line toward the thrushes along the bank of Lake Oleander. The electric motor at the bow of the John boat pushed the aluminum hull through the water. 
The morning was pleasantly warm. A blanket of clouds and e a blanket of clouds the evening before kept the heat in, dissipating just in time to let the morning sun continue the warning trend. A slight mugginess hung in the air, clinging like an uncomfortable suit of clothes. But Wayland didn't mind. An orange five-gallon pail held the day's take so far. Three crappies and two bluegills fluttered their fins uselessly, as if resigned to their fate, not the kind of haul he'd anticipated. The bass decided to stay home that morning. Rounding the bend in the quiet lake, he cast his line in the direction of a log sticking up out of the water. The log always lay there, a gnarled old signpost for the anglers of the area. It marked the beginning of a much larger tree, which branched out along the bottom of the lake. His grandfather taught him as a young boy how to tie a line and bait hooks in this exact spot. Remember to cast directly behind you in a boat like this. Not much room here, and I don't want to be put on your hook. I'd make bad bait. What kind of fish do you think would eat me, Waylon? The memory of his grandfather made him smile. A massive man, probably six feet tall, he could do no wrong. Even now, as an adult, Waylon remembered the scent of the old man's Zippo lighter. Smoking is a filthy habit, he told the young Waylon. Wish I'd never picked it up. His grandfather served in two world wars, or two wars, World War II and Korea. Although the family purposely never talked about it, little Waylon's overactive curiosity got the better of him. One day he asked his grandfather about the war and instantly regretted it. A look of sadness told the young boy all he needed to know. Wayland's mother said the sadness was remembering friends lost in combat. At the sound of his lure hitting the water, a nearby turtle made an immediate escape below the watery surface. Wayland felt bad for disturbing the turtle slumber. Something jerked at the lure under the surface. Either a fish or the lure hooked something while he was playing the line. He knew the area well enough that it wasn't the log, so it must be something else below the mirror-like surface of the lake. He let out line. It slackened, and for a moment it didn't move. The lure sunk its hook in something below the waterline. A few tricks to remove the hook from whatever it snagged onto, the lure didn't want to budge. The only remedy seemed to be to move the boat closer. The trolling motor laid a, made a low groan as Wayland pointed the John boat toward the log. If he wasn't careful, he'd snag the line on either the trolling motor or the engine at the stern of the boat. Nearing the log, he set the fishing pole down and plunged his hand into the ice-cold water. The lake was spring-fed, originally created by someone damming up a river that cuts its way through the area. When he was young, he'd heard stories about how the lake swallowed up an entire town, the ruins of which remained at the bottom of the lake. There was also a tall tale of a lake monster, which lived in its murky depths. His grandfather told him tons of stories about the lake, stories that filled young Wayland's imagination with sightings of the Oleander Lake monster. In his dreams, lake people carried on a perfect existence under the water. Recole recollections of the tall tales always brought a smile to his face. This spot, however, only plunged to a few feet deep. Retrieving the line didn't present much of a challenge. Despite the warmth of the day, the water chilled him to the bone. Lake Oleander maintained a constant cold or constant current with cold springs feeding it and water exiting in a small stream on the southernmost point. The water refreshed the water refreshed during the summer when you swam in the heat and chilled to the bone when you didn't want to be wet. No one ever swam in this part of the lake, leaving it quiet for fishing. Reaching down, he traced the line into the murky mud-brown depths. The lead weights in the top of the lure sat only six inches below, indicating the hook was only a few more inches toward the bottom. The hook buried itself deep into something soft, like an old bag made of rubber or perhaps a discarded child's ball. The pull of the line felt spongy with a little give as he pulled. Part of the object was covered in fine grass. Grabbing a slightly spongy protrusion from one side, Wayland pulled the thing up toward the boat. Almost losing his balance, he recoiled, recoiled in horror as the object crested the surface of the water. What he'd used as a handle came off, leaving the rest of the ghastly thing to plop back into the water. In his hand, the remains of a human nose, waxy and cold. Throwing his fishing pole into the water along with the ghastly appendage, he scrambled back toward the engine, tripping over one of the metal seats in panic. For a moment, the head rolled from one side to another. One eye hanging from the skull lay flush against the cheek in a mangled mess of tissue. 
The eye sockets of the unfortunate cranium were sunken in the cloudy eyes with no pupil, and a cloudy eye with no pupil stared back at him. Skin, the color of light brown, hung gingerly to the skull as if preparing to slither off the bones the second anyone attempted to retrieve it from the watery grave. He recognized the head, even in its current condition, as belonging to Carl Jensen, a hiker well known on the trails in Virginia, yeah. last seen by a group of fellow hikers 20 miles south of town, with a girl he'd befriended on the trail, missing since Monday before. The townspeople knew and participated in what befell the young man. The town stayed silent on the affair. It wasn't, it wasn't the first hiker to happen into town and was never seen again. It likely wouldn't be the last. He tapped the head with the end of an oar and watched it roll over and sink back into the water. The severed remains of the young man's neck hung briefly at the surface. Something nibbled on the exposed tendons and jaggedly torn skin at the base of the neck. The sight horrified Waylon, not because it was a severed head, it was alarming that the head was seen at all. Waylon withdrew a small flask from his pocket and took a long swig, hoping against hope that the whiskey would calm his frayed nerves. The elixir did its job, helping to erase the image of the fishing lure embedded in Carl's, Carl Jensen's earthly remains. Either way, the day of fishing was done. He needed to find Donnie. He always knew what to do. Firing up the motor, the John boat fled the final resting place of Carl Jensen as fast as the little motor would carry it. The churning of the water by his boat engine forced the head to bob to the surface once more. A crane swooped down into the shallow water and landed next to it, using its elongated beak to it pecked one of the eyes from the eye sockets, pulling it free for a morning snack. And that's chapter two. I'm going to go ahead and read one more chapter. Um, and I, I had planned it out that way. And for those of you who've known me for any length of time and know kind of what I do, uh, like on vacations and whatnot, uh, the, the Lake Oleander description of the... Uh, the, the tree and whatnot actually comes from a lake that's in my life that actually comes from Coons Lake, Indiana, uh, which is a place that I spent considerable time at as a child. So it had quite an impact on me. Uh, my grandfather actually did tell me a story uh, of the, the Coons Lake muck monster, we call it. Uh, so it's kind of legendary around those parts. But also uh, he told me when I was a kid that there was a uh, town at the bottom of the lake and uh, and I, as a kid, I just naturally assumed that that meant that there was a town fully functioning at the bottom of the lake, but the water had flooded out and the people were all still down there. Um, anyway, but that's the that's what the mind of a young child comes up with. So it's sort of funny how the things that are in your life and have been part of your life up until now always influence what you write. It's very common with writers. Uh, I say that we're the ultimate plagiarists because we take what we know, what we've seen, and what we've done, and uh, it becomes part of what we write in the future. So anyway, on to chapter three. Chapter three's title is A Well-Earned Rest. <clears throat> Honey, did you remember to pack your swimsuit? Yes, Mom, I packed it. Sheesh, I'm 17. I'm perfectly capable of packing for myself. A woman stood next to the car, giving her son an aggravated look. Okay, Mr. Smarty Pants, you don't have to get snotty with me. Megan Johnston had only one thing in life that meant anything. That thing had just turned 17 years old and threatened to get a full scholarship to a university far away from home. Twelve years before, his daddy left them both. A mother and a boy of five left alone to make their way in the world. That same five-year-old now 12 years later, berated her for being too much of a mother. So, Mr. Man of the House, did you remember a razor so you can shave that stupid-looking thing you have growing in your chin? On Earth, we call it a beard, and yes, I did. Good. Then let's go. He begged to stay home. Kyle wanted nothing more than to spend time at home this summer, hanging out with his friends and playing video games. A little guilt from Mom and, Ka and Kyle conceded the battle. I'm only asking you to sacrifice a couple of days with your mother. You know, someday I'll be dead and you are going to feel bad for not spending more time with me. Besides, the lake will have a beach and on that beach will likely be girls. Girls weren't the motivation she wanted to home in on, but however, it seemed to do the trick. A few minutes later, 
Megan and her progeny drove through the outskirts of town toward the wilds of Virginia. Selected destination, a resort which contacted them off a waiting list of candidates desiring a discount rate. For the last three years, they found their way to a summer waiting list for people interested in filling up empty rooms at the last minute. Ordinarily, the timing didn't work out, and this year, the phone call, available funds, and a week off work all coincided. They got the room for a steal, since the resort had cancellations. The stay included breakfast buffet, or the stay included a breakfast buffet, a free boat rental, and it had a small beach and a water park. Megan had nothing planned beyond playing board games and working on a tan while he ran off and enjoyed the lake. The outside morphed from cityscape to countryside. Soon the forest gave, ways, gave way to the foothills of the Shenandoah Valley. She glanced over at Carl and tussed his hair while he read a book. He batted her hand away and said in an annoyed tone, Mom, stop! Then went right back to reading. A string of dead-end jobs, an abusive husband who left them, and a mortgage which sometimes threatened to overwhelm their meager resources stood out as the normal state of life. But all of that faded when Megan watched her rambunctious son grow up before her. Megan, or Kyle had been a great kid and turned into a great man. For every bad thing or difficult situation she'd in endured, Kyle made up for it all. You know, Kyle, I'm going to miss this. Miss what? he asked, not taking his eyes off the book. Us taking trips together. A real last chance to hang out as mom and son. After this, you're all grown up. Mom, I'm pretty much already there. She laughed. Of course he was right. Not to me. You're always going to be my little guy. He made a face that couldn't quite hide a tiny smirk. That's embarrassing. Of course it is. I get to embarrass you. That's my job. When you were born, the doctor said, here you go. Now embarrass the hell out of him. Well, while you're busy embarrassing me, can we get something to eat? I'm starving. Sure, honey. Along the roadside, two giant signs for a truck stop called Starlight promised the best root beer floats in the galaxy. <clears throat> Megan pulled the car into the packed parking lot. Feeding Kyle became more of a challenge as he grew. A switch flipped somewhere in Kyle when he hit the age of 12 and the boy hadn't stopped eating since. On top of that, the kid perpetually needed new clothes and shoes, which kept the family's funding near the breaking point. The diner itself featured a sprawling parking lot with plenty of spaces for cars and several longer spaces for semi-trucks to pull into. The diner's booths and tables teemed with life. Every stool at the counter was appropriately topped with truckers sipping down coffee and swapping stories of their latest hauls to Poughkeepsie, Dearborn, Cleveland, or any number of places. Many proudly showed off pictures of their family's latest achievements while others sat at tables talking to their wives on cell phones. They looked sad to Megan, like they'd do anything to be at home right now rather than on this lonely piece of road somewhere. Megan and Kyle took seats in a booth right next to an old trucker who just put away his cell phone. He regarded them both for a moment and said, Evening, ma'am. Evening, son. Good evening, they said in unison. He went back to reading his paper, and she and Kyle opened the menus and the waitress set, that the waitress set before them. So, Kyle, Megan teased, what's your pleasure? Are you just going to order one of everything? Kyle patted his belly for emphasis. I saw the pot roast special on the board. It spoke to my soul. Pot roast is gone. Sorry, the waitress said. But Charlie was the prep cook this morning, and he makes a hell of a meatloaf. One open-faced meatloaf sandwich should be out of this world. Kyle smiled. Oh, well, if Charlie made it, then who are we to argue? I'll have one of those and a famous root beer float to go with it. Megan rolled her eyes. I'll have the meatloaf sandwich and a cup of coffee. All right, then. Be up in a couple of minutes. The waitress walked back to the window, separating the kitchen from the dining area, clipping the order to the wheel, and left to make the root beer float. Kyle studied the top of the table. Once a formica tabletop, Someone had refinished it with several layers of clear laminate coating, covering a collection of newspaper articles. He perused a story from eight years ago, featuring a rash of mysterious disappearances. It's kind of an odd thing to put on a table in a restaurant. The trucker in the booth next to them lowered his paper and eyed Kyle for a moment. You know the story behind those newspaper, that newspaper article you're reading, young man? 
No, sir, I don't. Man who owns this place is Fre Fred Stevens. Navy man in Vietnam took shrapnel and got sent home. He did all right, though. Got married and had a couple of kids. Lived here a long time. He built those tables. About ten years ago, people disappeared from town under odd circumstances. Made every paper in the state. Sounds like a ghost story to me, Megan said. The old trucker's story made her feel a bit uncomfortable. Well, you could be right, the old man said. See, none of the, no one knows what happened to those people. They all went missing, right under the noses of everyone in town. One day they were here, and next day is gone. Well, one of those people who went missing was Mrs. Stevens. Old Fred kept every newspaper and every bit of information on the case. At one point, they made copies of the articles and made them into tabletops in case any someone passing through town might remember a small detail. Anything that will help bring his wife home. How many went missing, Kyle said. Eh, about 25 total. At least one of them we think may have run off with a girlfriend. Sounds like kind of a far-fetched story if you ask me, Megan said. I mean, how can 25 people just go missing? Didn't they ever find any evidence of what happened to them? The old man took a deep sip of coffee and stared out the window toward the trees on the other side of the highway, pondering what string of words would, be, would best answer the difficult question. Putting the cup down and letting out a heavy sigh, he stared into Megan's eyes, searching for answers he himself struggled with for years. You know, there are people in this world who go on around us, and they're essentially non-people. Let me ask you a question. The last delivery driver who came up to your house, do you remember his name? Of course you don't. You only cared that they were there on time, were fast, and then they left. The waitress who gave you the coffee, do you remember her name? Rose. Her name is Rose, Kyle said. Very good, young man. I'm impressed. Most people don't notice little things that matter most in life. You know, I have over 30 years of trucking behind me, and I can count in one hand the number of repeat deliveries where the manager of the store even knew my name, or knew I'd been there before. Many people scurry in and out of our lives, and we never even notice them, not even if they go missing. We may realize a different waitress brought us a cup of coffee, or a different delivery driver came to our door, but no one ever misses them. Tank, quit scaring the customers, you old crazy codger, Rose said, approaching with two plates full of food and a tall frosty root beer float. Excuse me, ma'am, I, I have your meatloaf fresh and hot from the oven. For the young man, his is on us tonight. Oh, you don't have to do that, Megan protested. Ma'am, your son remembered my name. That's more than uh, more than can be said for half the brain-dead fart weasels who came through those doors most nights. He's a fine boy, really classed up the joint. And ladies on me, Tank said. He raised a hand to cut off Megan's impending protest. Before you go arguing, you'd be insulting a retired truck driver and army veterans if you refuse. I'd take it, sweetie, Rose said tank has never picked up a check for anyone outnumbered two to one megan smiled as she gave in wow thank you both i don't know what to say she took a whiff of the food as rose set it in front of her so where are you headed rose continued i'm assuming you're on your way to the mountains yep you'd be right we're taking a mother's son vacation for a few days at her use of the words mother son vacation kyle squinted at his mother and took a deep slurp of his float any place in particular, or just anywhere that strikes your fancy to stop? Tank asked. She dabbed her mouth with a napkin. A place called Hideaway Resort on Lake Oleander. We got a great deal on a recent cancellation. As Megan took a sip of her coffee, Tank and Rose exchanged a knowing glance. Barely perceptible, yet still enough to convey a hidden meaning. Just be careful up there. On the other side of the lake, there's a town called Riopoke. I'd steer clear of it. They're not particularly friendly to strangers up that way. Tank pushed the empty cup toward Rose, still standing next to the table. Anyway, I have to go. Tank stood and slapped $30 on the table and grabbed a John Deere hat from next to his empty coffee cup. It's a pleasure meeting you folks. You have a nice vacation. Just stick to the resort while you're up there and you'll be fine. Without another word, Tank walked out of the door, disappearing into the late afternoon. That seemed a little weirdish. Kyle said. Megan nodded in agreement. Oh, that's just old Tank. Being a trucker for 30 years fries your brain. Too many pulled pork sandwiches and cups of diner coffee will do that to you. But he's right about one thing. 
Not a friendly bunch of people you'll find up there in Riopoke. Just be careful, was all. Her face brightened. Say, you know, I need to get y'all some pecan pie. No, oh geez, no, we don't need, we don't want to impose, Megan said, putting up a hand in protest. No imposition. I I'm about to throw it out. Besides, it's store-bought. Not the greatest pie in the world. You'd be saving me space in the trash. For a while, they both sat in silence and ate their dinners. Megan thought about what Tank had said. It had been a strange conversation, made even stranger by Rose confirming the odd story. Maybe it was one of those local legends which pervaded the countryside. Rose wasn't kidding about the pie. It was good, but definitely store-bought. Two scoops of vanilla bean ice cream it came with made up for the unimpressive pie. Megan only ate about half of the meatloaf and half of a slice of pie, and it felt like she was going to burst. Kyle, being a typical teenage boy, finished his meal first, and then the rest of her dinner. The boy was a garbage disposal on feet. Megan glanced over at his plate. Are you full for once? For a little while. Do you think we can get some meatloaf to go? He said. Her eyes got big as saucers. Are you kidding me? Tell me you're kidding me. Well, maybe I am. He shrugged his shoulders. Rose came over to the table again. Any more coffee, Megan? Rose and Megan had become fast friends when the conversation moved past Lake Oleander. Thanks, Rose. I think I'm good. Kyle, I don't even think the truck drivers ever eat that much. I don't know where you put it all. You have to keep eating, though, you handsome devil, you. I swear, if I was 17 again, I'd be hanging all over you. You were just the most handsome thing in the world. Kyle blushed at Rose's over-the-top flirtations. Thank you, ma'am. And polite to boot, he's a keeper, that boy yours. She winked at Megan before tending to the other customers. Back in the car, Kyle fell asleep. Blessed with the ability to fall asleep anywhere and at any time, the car proved an irresistible napping place. They didn't have far to go. Still, the sun would set before they pulled into the resort. Megan enjoyed the visit to the odd truck stop, even if it was a little longer than expected. It was a delightful place filled with delightful people, and the food was pretty good. She thought long and hard about what Tank said. That nice yet somewhat odd retiree made a good point. People do go through their lives in a veritable fog, never knowing who's coming and who's going. The pizza delivery guy, the last time they ordered, was a stranger to them, even though he's, there's a good chance he lived in their neighborhood. Although certain they, would, they had the same mailman for the last few years, she drew a blank on his name. The same was true of the UPS driver who worked their route. They just all faded into the background. However, if any of them failed to live up to her expectations, she'd call them out in an instant. It wasn't that they did anything wrong. She tended to vent her frustration at the entire world, as if bringing someone else down made her feel better about herself. It would be easy for one of them to go missing, and she'd never notice. So I think that's going to conclude uh, the end of my reading today. Uh, I'm going to save this off so I can use it again for other things. I'm also going to use this audio as part of the podcast. I'm going to clean it up a little bit. Um, and maybe I'll run it as like a, a an extra podcast out there. Um, so anyway, thank you for joining me. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm probably going to do the same thing next weekend for a little while. Um, and maybe I'll continue on. So that was chapter one, two, and three of the book Reapoke. It's available. Uh, you can go to briannowak.com and you can find it there. Uh, you can also find it on Amazon Thankfully, with a name like Riapoke, by the way, the name Riapoke actually is uh, an Algonquian Indian word. Now, what most people don't know is that the Algonquian language is not a language in and of itself. It's actually a broad category of languages that were used by Native Americans. Uh, the term Riapoke in most of those language would roughly be translated into the devil or the evil, depending on how you, which family group you're in. Um, so that kind of gives it away a little bit of what's going on in the storyline. Um, but I hope you enjoyed the reading and um, have a great day. Thank you for dropping in. Bye.